Uh, we are trying to accommodate as many people as possible, so please get comfortable. Uh, um, this is quite an, an impressive crowd, um, and it's really exciting to see so many people, um, faces, familiar and unfamiliar. Uh, I am Michelle Salzman. I am the chair of the Sesquicentennial Committee of the Society for Classical Studies. I'm also vice president for the program committee. And I am honored and pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, Mary Beard. It, she has been um, uh, a long time coming to these shores. Uh, in 2016, the then president of the Society for Classical Studi Studies, Roger Bagnell, asked me to chair the Sesquicentennial Committee because I am vice president of the program committee. So I and Matthew McGowan and Stephen Hines, and a shout out to you both, um, have been planning the uh, five sesquicentennial panels that you've enjoyed, talking about the past, present, and future of classics. In preparation for this meeting, we thought about who would be a very exciting public speaker, who has made classics relevant and has been able to make classics accessible for millions of people, both in the field and outside the field. And there was huge consensus that Mary Beard would be a great person to have as our public speaker. And so she very kindly agreed to come. And indeed, she is the second of our public um, speakers. We had Louis Ferro on Thursday evening. And this evening, we have Mary Beard. She has um, done um, tremendous work in making classics um, a, a household word. Um, people know Mary's work, and she has a loyal and very large Twitter following. Um, they will be happy to know, as you will, that the Society for Classical Studies is filming Mary's talk today. Um, it will be available online at some point um, for, for our members to enjoy. Um, so we want to make this talk accessible um, following in Mary's footsteps. There is, um, her success is really phenomenal, and your presence here proves that. Um, if it grows out of a conviction that she said, and I'm quoting that what she told an interview, interviewer, she wouldn't work on Rome if she didn't think it had something to do with the present. Why would you spend your life buried in the past, she asks. And I agree, and so do you. Um, and that is why her talk will be of immediate relevance, I think. Um, to us as we think about um, classics, both its 150 years past as an institution, uh, society, its present and its future. As advertised, Mary will be speaking on what do we mean by classics now? Why should we study the ancient Greeks and Romans and other ancient cultures? How do we weigh up the radical understanding of the classics versus the conscription of classics into a modern far-right agenda? I join you in looking forward to hearing her thoughts on these important subjects. Please welcome our featured public speaker, Mary Beard. Um, hello, everybody. It's absolutely great to be here, and I hope you're all comfortable. I, I feel very honoured that you've turned up, and I feel very honoured to have been asked. You know, I don't always behave terribly well, but um, the uh, American Academy of Classicists and others have always been incredibly generous to me, and I'm very grateful for that. So to get down to business, uh, I'd like to start this evening by going back a century and a half to the very first annual meetings of this society. It was then known as the American Philological Association, of course, or the APA for short. The meetings were held in July and mostly in college towns of the East Coast, from Poughkeepsie to Providence, Rhode Island. And they were small affairs, um, with delegates numbering in the tens rather than in the hundreds of us here now. 
And I have to say, there was no conference hotels. It's, this sounds absolutely ghastly. Lodgings was provided with the local residents. Uh, and I think it was in part a tribute to the hospitality of Pukepsi and of Vassar College there that one paper at the very first meeting of the society in 1869 was devoted to a learned disquisition on the history of the spelling and pronunciation of the name Pukepsi, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, the founders were a group of serious white men. Within a few years or so, the association did have some African-American and female members in a way I think that would have been unthinkable in the UK at the time, but nevertheless in tiny numbers. Or what you can see here is a very unrepresentative sample of early members of the APA. And the main mission of what has become our society um, was to promote hardcore philology. Now, exactly what they meant by philology, I'll come back to, but the titles of the early papers really give away the style and the association's interest. Listen to this. A paper on the metaphysics of the Greek subjunctive, I'm quoting, needless to say, produced a warm discussion. <laughs> If only, those were the days, right? <laughs> and that was in a newspaper report, and it was apparently written without any irony whatsoever. Um, they were also, I should add, keen on issues of pedagogy. Should you learn a modern language before an ancient one, or vice versa? And on the endlessly fascinating topic of how to pronounce Latin. In a rare, and they were rare, I think, in a rare moment of hilarity, at the first annual meeting, one of the association's officers was made to read out the Latin words in his speech all over again because he had failed to speak them according to the pronunciation rules that they just established, right? <laughs> now, to be honest, the efforts of this association did divide outside opinion. Some commentators applauded its scholarly contribution. And one in 1874 actually congratulated the annual meeting for being so single-minded on their business that they didn't waste any time on parties. So I think they'd be a bit shocked by us today. But others felt that the whole outfit was just a little bit too earnest. They were always talking about the same subjects, you know, subjunctives, aorists, inclitics, and conditionals again, right? And it was said they were totally removed from the concerns of the average American. I think it was true. What did it all add up to? Asked one journalist. His answer was words, 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 right? <laughs> Now, tonight I shall be returning to some of those particular themes of the early APA, but it's really the broader underlying questions of how we as a community see ourselves in the history of this subject of classics, how far it and or we have changed over a century or so, and how we tell the story of the institutional past. And it's those kind of questions that launch my bigger points tonight and ones that I hope are relevant to an audience beyond uh, merely the professionals. I want to unpick some of the myths that most of us buy into when we imagine what classics was like 100 years or so ago. And I want to do that for the simple reason that it's important to open our eyes wide to the history of the subject if we want to know where to take it or to follow it next. Are students, I'm going to ask, now really so much worse at Latin and Greek than their predecessors were in the late 19th century? 
Has Classics really been such a compliant and faithful servant of establishment power, monoculture, and the political right? Have we inherited now a subject that never before worried about its boundaries, about who or what was included or excluded? To put it bluntly, my sense is that classicists are now much better at interrogating ancient myths than they are at interrogating their own myths about themselves. And far too often they, or I should say we, fall into rather comfortable self-flagellation, and that's an oxymoron but it's intentional, on the state of the discipline in crisis. Now, some of this self-flagellation is entirely justified, and it's not to say long overdue. We only have to look around this room to wonder you know, quite what our commitment to diversity, for example, is to see who's encouraged to be interested in classics, who becomes so. So some of that uh, self-criticism is justified, but not all of it. Uh, so let me warn you, uh, I am going to finish at the end of my talk with a very definite hint of optimism about the subject now and in the future. But what is this subject that I've got in mind? I'm talking about how classics has been taught, learned and researched since the second half of the 19th century and on into the future. Now by classics, I mean the study of the languages, literature, the culture and antiquities of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds and the ways in which we have defined our relationship to that antiquity. Now, if there are some people in the room who are already bristling because I have restricted my definition of classics to Greece and Rome, put the bristles away for a moment because I shall be coming back to that problem soon. I'm also focusing on the last 150 years or so then on because that is the relatively short lifetime of classics as an academic subject as we know it. Now, obviously, there were many people centuries earlier who were extremely learned in all things Greece, Greek and Roman, but no one called themselves a classicist in our sense, like I would define myself, until the 1860s. Our classics is a product of the differentiation of academic subjects post-1850, when for the first time to define yourself as a classicist began to mean that you weren't something else. You weren't a theologian, you weren't a historian or whatever. And it's no accident that that APA was founded at that point when these disciplines are beginning to take shape. Now, I should underline too that I'm talking mainly about the US and the UK, and you'd get another story if I focus, for example, on Germany or on the global classics that we heard about on the presidential panel yesterday. And with a very broad brush, lumping together small colleges, big colleges, all the rest, I'm treating America and Britain pretty much hand in hand. Now, there are all kinds of differences in the history and the controversies of the subject on either side of the Atlantic. Much greater emphasis has always been put here on whether classics is useful or not. And the US has always had a much longer commitment to postgraduate education than the UK, partly because of a different relationship with the German tradition. Now, most of my teachers in Cambridge in the early 1970s had no PhD at all, and they were jolly well proud of it. You know, a doctorate was something to be a bit ashamed of, really. And there are other differences. I think the anxieties about the exclusivity of the study of the ancient world has been much more clearly inflected around 
class in the UK, around race here, and around gender pretty much equally. But for all those things that uh, divide us, there are more concerns, debates, and myths about what classics is that we share. And it's some of those myths that I want to prod at tonight. Now, I'm going to start from something that almost every one of us will take as a self-evident fact, that students now, and probably many of their teachers, know a lot less Latin and Greek than they used to know a century ago, when both in the United States and in the UK, those languages were absolutely embedded in years of elite high school teaching, and when one or both of them were a compulsory, compulsory requirement for admission to many universities. We have a picture, I think, where you imagine these young men, and they are mostly men, and you think, give them a bit of Greek to translate, give them an ode of Pindar, and they just be able to do it. And it's not like that now, we would say. Now, predictably, perhaps, we put different ideological spins on whether we think it's a good thing or a bad thing, that it's not like that now. The more conservative amongst us lament that kind of lost expertise, and they can be occasionally heard to deplore that some people, even among the professoriate, don't really know, oh my God, what a gerund is. The more radical amongst us see the advantage of having freed students from the grammar grind and from the fetish of linguistic competence. But my question tonight is not about different ideologies. It's really about if we went back to the late 19th century, would we have found a golden age of Latin and Greek learning? Now, that general picture is certainly underpinned by colourful anecdotes, none more so than anecdotes about Richard Jebb, who you see on screen now, the famous editor of the Tragedies of Sophocles, a student and later in the 1890s, professor of Greek in Cambridge. Now, I have to confess, I don't much warm to Jeb. He isn't my cup of tea, really. Um, in fact, in a rather apt quip, the head of his Cambridge college is supposed to have said, what time Jeb can spare from the adornment of his person, he devotes to the neglect of his duties. All right. <laughs> Spot on. He always wants to use that one again, right? And one American observer visiting England nicely captured his absolutely appalling affectations. Uh, all the time, I'm quoting here, all the time the man is lecturing, he tries to make a double spiral twist out of his legs and casts from side to side an agonised stare at his auditors. His voice is high-pitched in the fashionable English style. And his utterance is broken every few minutes by a distressing, hysteric cough, right? So can't, thank you, lucky stars, you got me, not Jeb, tonight. But whatever you make of him, there is no doubt that he could translate Greek and Latin with a preternatural facility and certainly much better than I can. One fellow student described how he behaved in the translation papers of his degree exams. Apparently, he walked into the exam room, picked up his pen, turned the paper over, didn't give it another thought, just translated the Greek and Latin straight away at sight, and walked out again before the others were even halfway through. He'd finished. We know from his own letters that he then went back to his college and wrote to his mum, to say that he was convinced he had failed, and he came out top of the class, right? That, there's something in every aspect of that story to make you absolutely sick. <laughs> you know, especially the bit about, oh, mum, I think I've failed. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> but again, my question is, was Jeb remotely typical of the language learners of his day? Now, it takes only a few moments 
to see that he cannot possibly have been. You know, any more than, say, the Latin skills of Chris Krauss or Tony Woodman or most people here today are typical of the average student. It's true that spending years on Latin and Greek at high school might have helped students reach a level of fluency that those who have now only studied the languages for a few months can't reach. But there is no reason to suppose that it did, at least not widely. In fact, if you dig around, there's plenty of evidence that it did not. And the refrains are very similar on both sides of the Atlantic. The opposition when it came, for example, to compulsory Greek for admission both to Harvard and Cambridge UK was not only because it was an extremely socially inclusive requirement, but also because it was absolutely pointless. <laughs> because it didn't actually teach students any useful Greek at all. Now, if you're interested in following that up, I uh, recommend a very sparky Phi Beta Kappa lecture given at Harvard in 1883 by Charles Francis Adams Jr., who, among other reasons he has for abolishing compulsory Greek, he deplores the time wasted, the nightmare of my youth, as he calls it, being forced to, quote, learn a language that he couldn't in any meaningful sense read at the end of the process. Now, Adams is not an unbiased witness. He's got an axe to grind, particularly against Greek. But what he said does actually chime in with the examination papers of the time, at least where you can find them. And they tend to be uh, preserved only at rather self-confident institutions who have the self-importance to think that people will be interested in their exam papers, um, uh, which is what I've been able to consult. Let me just give you a couple of examples, and you'll see what I mean about the fruitlessness of this. This is a sentence that candidates for admission to Harvard in the 1860s were asked to translate into Greek. And don't laugh at it, because it's what we had to translate when I was young. Quote, translate into Greek, it is said that the king sent them away, fearing lest they should perish by remaining. Right? Absolutely classic gobbledygook that we all had to translate. Right? And you look at it, and I look at it first, and I think, well, that's a, not a bad test of basic. If you could translate that into Greek, you wouldn't be doing badly. Until you notice that the exam paper actually gave you the Greek words for said, for king, for send away, for fear, for perish, and remain. Right? <laughs> So it wasn't that difficult. You just had to string them together in a plausible way. And it was much the same in Cambridge, England, too, where actually these much vaunted tests of Latin and Greek competence were really memory tests. The basic qualifying exam at Cambridge demanded translation from three prescribed set books. There's one in Latin, one in Greek, and a book of the New Testament in Greek. The fact that most of the people taking this exam learnt the crib, they just learnt a translation, was actually even admitted on the exam paper itself. Because in relation to the New Testament, the instruction, at least in some years, ran, instruction to the people who were taking the exam, candidates are advised to base their translations as closely as possible on the authorised version. In other words, <laughs> learn the authorised version of the Bible, spot what the passage was, and then spew it out again. Right? So, so much for learning Greek, even if you have the cash to be coached for it. So I have no doubt uh, that we can be optimistic here that late 19th century classics was 
much less linguistically competent than we imagine. I think what we ought to be doing really is asking what drives our commitment to that view of the past as a kind of place when everybody knew their language. And in fact, it's not a new kind of nostalgia and depression. When the British Classical Association, which is really the younger sister of this society, was founded in 1903, the explicit reason for founding this association was to rescue Latin and Greek from imminent extinction. Now, it's really very hard for us to imagine in 1903, British classicists really thought they were going down the tubes, but that was what they publicly claimed. And it's a strand of kind of disciplinary anxiety that we find embedded in modern classics that I'll come back to in a bit. But now I'm going to look at another myth about classics, and one that's a bit less mythical but still needs a bit more nuancing than it often gets. Right, now, on the screen here is an image that sums my myth up here. It's a cartoon from a 1950s British children's book called How to Be Top. And it features, the cartoon features, the author of the most famous Latin grammar textbook in the UK, first published in the late 19th century and still in print. And he's B.H. Kennedy, who you see on the bottom right. But in the cartoon, you see Kennedy in the guise of an imperial explorer, or perhaps better, exploiter, who has tracked down the poor little gerund bird, animal, and is obviously going to take the gerund back to his grammatical zoo. It's a cartoon that obviously points a finger at the imperial connections of classics and indirectly at the role of classics in the formation and gatekeeping of the elite. For Kennedy, the author of the textbook, had been one of the most famous or infamous classics teachers of wealthy boys, while the anti-hero of How to Be Top is Nigel Molesworth, who you see here, a lad who pointedly refuses to be moulded into elite shape even when they do force-feed him Latin, right? He's a real little rebel. So I think we've got those, those two sides of imperialism but also elite training that comes out of that cartoon. Uh, I should say, by the way, at this point, that Chris Trey has proved that although B.H. Kennedy's name was on the title page of the book, and although I just called him the author, the grammar book was actually written by his daughters, Marion and Julia. But that's another story of women written out of the picture. Now, it's always, I think, very hard to assess the politics of classics. Partly because as a discipline, although classics may become politicised, it doesn't actually have a politics. It would be willfully and dreadfully blind to deny that like many other subjects, like nuclear physics, for example, uh, it has been put to some terribly toxic uses, uh, from the defence of slavery to its conscription by the far right as Donna Zuckerberg has documented. But I think we risk over-egging the toxicity of the history of the politics of classics if we don't also remember the liberal and radical campaigns that classical literature has underwritten for at least two centuries. The legitimation of homosexuality, the extension of male franchise, resistance to military force and political oppression from occupied France to apartheid South Africa. Goebbels, it's true, may have taken some inspiration from classics, but so do did Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Hannah Arendt, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, to name just a few. But let's narrow it down a bit to the themes of that cartoon 
There's absolutely no doubt, of course, about the ideologically loaded parallels drawn by some Brits themselves between Roman imperialism and their own. There'd be no joke in this cartoon if that wasn't the case. But the ancient, and the ancient world certainly provided a range of imperial symbols and a language and a shorthand to talk about British successes or failures. I put those in inverted commas because it depends which side you're on. The Boer War was referred to, for example, as a new Sicilian expedition going back to the 5th century BC. But the all too common caricature of our own that imagines the British simply reclothing their imperial aggression in togas, while back home, battalions of classical scholars were hard at work underwriting that mirage, is as oversimplifying a picture as this picture of Kennedy and the Gerund. What it ignores is the debates, the disagreements of people in Britain at the time, the late 19th century, about the relationship of their empire to the Roman Empire and the sheer impossibility of ever making Rome and Britain quite fit. Now, I probably don't need to remind many of you that the most in-your-face imperialist monument in London remains this early 20th century statue of Boudicca, who was a rebel against the Romans, with a chilling inscription written underneath proclaiming that her descendants would, the descendants of this early British queen would rule more territory than the Romans ever had. But that is what I mean by the impossibility of alignment. Britain and the British can't ever quite make sense of their own relationship to Rome or to the enemies of Rome. It's not as simple as simply seeing themselves as Romans. And the idea also that you often read about, that they believed that people who'd studied Latin and Greek were the ideal people to rule the empire, was also a contested one. Sometimes it's true, entry to what is euphemistically known as the Indian civil service, which was, was well-equipped, it was neither Indian nor civil, um, was sometimes dominated by people who'd studied classics, usually at Oxford. But sometimes the rules for this branch of imperial, uh, let's call it administration, um, were the rules of entry were actually designed to exclude people who'd studied classics at Oxford or Cambridge. And when uh, the classicist um, Benjamin Jowett, you see on the screen here, a very odd, maybe typical combination of a late Victorian guy with um, absolutely ghastly self-confidence mixed with massive insecurity. Um, <laughs> when Jowett thundered about classicists, you know, the study of Latin and Greek made people the only people who were suited to govern anything, whether that was the empire or a home. Jowett was not stating the obvious. He was tendentiously responding to a load of people who thought quite the opposite. And there is an irony that while in the late 19th century, Jowett here was busy trying to recruit classicists in Oxford to serve the empire, a guy called C.P. Scott, who himself had studied classics at Oxford uh, and went on to become the editor of the Manchester Guardian, which was the most powerful anti-imperial paper in the country, Scott was trying to hoover the very same people up to use their classical training to denounce the empire. So you've got classics on both sides uh, of, of, this, of this imperial debate. But however extreme Jowett's views were, they raised the wider question of how classics operated in the structure of power and career advantage, how far it acted as a gatekeeper 
for the elite on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, there is a compelling argument here. Um, what more efficient way could there possibly be of simultaneously mystifying and policing the boundaries of elite status than making the terms of entry into the elite the master, the mastery of one or two dead languages that no one spoke, right? That's basically what it is. Uh, and a sociologist could not have invented that system better if they'd tried. But again, it isn't all quite what it seems on the surface. If you look back, for example, to uh, the careers of members of parliament in the United Kingdom in the late 19th century, at least those that had been to university, um, you would find that a large number of them had studied classics. Um, truth is, there wasn't much else for them to study. But if you look again from the bottom up, you find a rather different picture. And you see that classics was not a straightforward passport to power. Now, I'm sorry to return to Cambridge, England again, but it's where I can mo most easily get the data, so it is what I've done. Uh, and if you look at, if you go through all the people who studied classics in Cambridge in the 1870s and the 1880s, and you say, what did they go on to do? What did these students do? Well, I am delighted to report that their commonest career destination was high school teaching. It was not running the empire, right? And if you add into the high school teachers all the country parsons in the Church of England that they went on to be, that usually accounts for well over 50% of each year's cohort. Most students of classics then and now did not go on to positions of power. Happily, they went on to be very ordinary. Great. I think we should feel pleased at that, right? But before I go on, I just want to highlight briefly, very briefly, one bigger theoretical issue um, before moving to a different topic. It's a theoretical issue and a theoretical crack, I think, in the social and racial exclusion that was supposedly policed by people having to learn classical languages. Now, it would be naive, I think, even if not entirely untrue, to claim that Latin and Greek, learning Latin and Greek, has always acted as a gate opener as well as a gate keeper. And there are obvious dangers, I think, here in letting individual success stories of ordinary people, working class people, people of color who learnt Latin and got an entry into the elite, there's always a danger of letting those individual success stories conceal the wider structural dis discrimination that Latin and Greek, in some ways, um, police. And it would be a terrible insult, I think, to suggest that for many of these people who do break through, somehow the gate had been left on the latch. Um, here you can see four people I've chosen just as people who do uh, break in. Um, there's Alexander Crummel, who was reputedly prompted to learn Greek by hearing of the notorious words of John C. Calhoun to the effect that no person of colour could ever manage to learn Greek, and that spurred him to go and do it in the story. Um, there's W.S. Scarborough, the first professional black classicist here, Grace McCurdy of Vassar, and Jane Harrison of Cambridge. All those four and all the others like them who were getting in from the outside had to break the gate down and they faced struggles once they were inside. But I think it's an important point to realize for us now that as some of even the most rigid exclusionists were themselves in the 19th century dimly aware is a fundamental and inescapable point that any defense of elite status that relies on intellectual talent and intellectual capacity and intellectual expertise as its boundary is 
always, always bound eventually to fall to the talents of those that it was constructed to exclude. Calhoun is almost, in saying that appalling, um, no person of colour could learn Greek, he is almost announcing, as he says that, his own wrongness. That cannot possibly be true. And it turned out not to be true. I'm very pleased here that uh, to put Crummel on the uh, screen because he uh, was an American but uh, determined to learn Greek. Uh, he couldn't learn Greek here. He was the first black student at Cambridge where he did learn Greek. Now, so far I've been stressing the controversies, the disagreements, the anxieties that have characterised classics throughout its disciplinary history. And these also include debates about what intellectual territory should it occupy? What should classics include? Now, the idea that it has always been a kind of bluff, unreflective sort of discipline, operating within uncontested boundaries, and a bit overconfident about its place in the hierarchy of knowledge, is one side of the story, but it's only one. Remember what I said about the Classical Association in the UK going back to an anxiety, even in 1903, about the future of classics. And over my own career, which is long but not that long, um, I've seen any number of territorial skirmishes and revolutions on the boundaries of the classical discipline. Where does late antiquity belong, for example? Or which department takes responsibility for Roman Egypt? Does Roman Egypt belong with the Romans or does it belong with the Egyptians? And what about the history of early Christianity? Should that be dis discussed by theologians or is it a religion of the Roman Empire? And more fundamentally, I remember in the 1970s, Moses Finlay, then in Cambridge, um, being a vocal advocate of freeing classics, freeing ancient history as a whole from classics and making it part of the history department, where in some places it is. Now, those disciplinary definitions are actually more important than they may seem, because where subjects lie in the disciplinary framework helps determine the direction of those subjects. It helps determine the makeup of the students. And of course, that disciplinary framework provides exactly what we need for interdisciplinarity to flourish. You can't be interdisciplinary if you don't have disciplines. Now, I very much doubt that it's a really important point. We think interdisciplinarity, oh, wow, you know, it's, you know isn't that great? Well, yeah, but you need a framework. Uh, I very much doubt that Finlay realised that people had been debating where ancient history belonged at least a century earlier. For it was at that period, while the discipline of classics and other disciplines were being formed, that what belonged where was particularly Fluid. And the early history of the APA is a great example of this, as well as showing the general direction of travel that we find elsewhere. As the debates a few years ago about renaming the society as the Society for Classical Studies rather than the American Philological Association brought to the surface, the association started out as an association for the study of language, philology, in its broadest or its narrowest sense. Words, 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 as the journalist said. Its first president was not a classicist, it was a sans Sanskritist. And the occasional papers that you find in the early meetings like this one on more general classical topics like the life of Thucydides, 1873, Look terribly out of place, actually, among all the papers on modern bilingualism, Native American vocabulary, Sanskrit verbs, English etymology, and a great one called Repetition in Shakespeare. Right? And it was across a period of some 30 years in the kind of tectonic shifts of disciplinary formation, including the formation of other specialist societies, like the MLA, or the Linguistic Society, that what 
was the APA became almost exclusively classical. So there's a big kind of, well, as I say, tectonic, tectonic plate shift. And I suppose put like that, and in retrospect, the changes seem quite self-evident and almost predictable. I think as uh, Eric Adler touched on it in a paper he gave yesterday, they were actually also deeply contested. And so too they were in the UK, where you find a similar shift in a way from philology to a much more cultural, broad definition of Greco-Roman classics. And that was all fought out in some very, very bitter academic wars. And the bloodiest battleground of these was actually again in Cambridge in the 1860s and 70s, where what has become the standard lineup of English classics, what you study if you go to university in the UK and study classics, apart from Oxford, which is very weird, um, was as you know, Greek and Latin languages, literature, philosophy, history, archaeology, and linguistics, that kind of package was first defined. And it was first defined, not because anybody wanted it like that, but as a rather awkward compromise between some rather kind of hardline conservatives who said that classics should go on being a linguistic, philological subject, and it needed to be Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, not just Latin and Greek, and those, the more radical, who wanted to get rid of some of that linguistic training and all the translation exercises and devote more attention to what classical culture was all about. One of the reformers lamented that you found students in Cambridge in the 1860s and they'd read loads of Plato, but they couldn't tell you what the theory of forms was or might be. What was earth was the point of that. They made a rather awkward compromise. They divided, they divided the whole syllabus into two uh, separate parts. One was two years of compulsory wall-to-wall -wall language. Um, and then you've got an optional uh, final year, if you wanted to do it, where you could do literature and philosophy and the rest. It's had a great history ever since. It's what we still teach. Initially, it didn't please anyone, and it certainly didn't please the students, because most of them decided not to take the optional year. Now, those changes have sometimes been seen as a kind of narrowing uh, of, of the classical curriculum to, a kind of, to, to the European Mediterranean, getting rid, marginalizing um, things like Sanskrit and uh, abandoning what was a, an earlier multicultural reach. And on paper, they do look a bit like that. But in practice, and much more importantly, they are an attempt to deepen the curriculum beyond technical linguistic expertise. Um, it was the, the reform's opponents, who were the narrow linguistic ideologues, who wanted to send ancient history away, because if you could get ancient history put into history, it wouldn't pollute the pure language that they wanted their students to be reading. And they were not, let me tell you, promoting Sanskrit in order to appreciate the poetry. All right? None of us are on their side. So I said at the start that if we didn't think hard about the history and the myths of classics, we'd make very poor strategists or judgment of where the subject is going to be. And I hope I've shown that classicists do have a strange investment in their subject's history, whether they see in the past a golden age of expertise and look wistfully back to it, or whether they see a toxic inheritance of imperialism of which to be ashamed, none of which points are entirely true. I've also, I hope, brought to life a few of the anxieties and the conflicts and the uncertainties that are embedded in this kind of disciplinary package and I might even have shown that some of these old 19th century blokes, some of them, were actually wrestling with the dilemmas that we share. But to finish, what of the future? Now, I'm not remotely suggesting that this kind of historical context 
and these historical debates and issues are an excuse for not making any changes in what this subject should be. I don't think it's a question of saying, oh, well, classics has always been a bit contested and a bit difficult and shrugging our shoulders and turning our backs. I think, in fact, the reverse is true. These myths that we live with about what classics is and the history of classics are actually, for me at least, a powerful prompt to think harder and more constructively about what is right and what is wrong about the classics that we know it and what kind of face we want classics to have, who we think should be engaged in the classical project. You know, what does a classicist look like now? Now, I'm trying to work towards some answer to that in my head. I return to something that Daniel Padilla Peralta said in last year's SCS panel on rhetoric then and now. He was talking then about diversity as a transformative act. And he memorably said that diversity in the classics should not just be about bringing new folks to old stuff. Right? Now, my first instinct was to agree with him. And in a way, I still do. But I found myself reflecting partly from the historical perspective that I've laid out that you could also argue that new folks in a subject actually change the stuff. Right? That was certainly the case if you go back to the first women in professional classics in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The likes of Jane Harrison on the screen here, and partly, let's face it, because of their status of semi-outsiders, were revolutionary in changing what people thought about the ancient world. In Harrison's case, digging through the calm and sober and rational surface, as it appeared, of Greek religion, and revealing the exciting, bloody irrationality underneath the surface. And in doing so, these women, and Harrison wasn't the only one, these women both seized a place for themselves within classical scholarship, but they also made it better, stronger, and a hell of a lot more interesting for everyone. That, I think, is what diversity means, and it's one reason, although fairness and natural justice, of course, are others, why we want more diversity. We talked this morning in another session about white men surrendering their privilege in the discipline of classics. I have no doubt that that will happen, and I have no doubt that it will hurt a bit, but I think the end result will be a subject that is better for all of us, including the white old men and the white old women, I have to say. And it's one of the kind of nicer things about the laws of the human race is that if you have a subject or an institution that's fair, it also tends to be more fun, all right? Diversity isn't about punitive action. It's about making it better for us all as well as for those we want to promote. So why is classics? Why does it have a problem with diversity? Well, I think it's always dangerous and a bit hubristic for insiders within a discipline to speculate why outsiders might be put off it. Um, speculation is often ignorant, self-serving, and it can easily become another kind of bit of the rhetoric of professional anxiety and comfortable self-flagellation. And I think the fault finding often doesn't hit the target. I suspect, for example, that in our little bubble, classical bubble, we fret far too much about the supposedly exclusive elitist hegemonic implication of just the word classics, right? Most people on the planet have never heard of Aulus Gellius. They have no idea that in the second century AD, he linked literary classics to the Latin vocabulary of social and economic hegemony. And if you meet someone in the street and you tell them that you study classics, they usually think you're studying Jane Austen, right? <laughs> right? In fact, 
for my money, there's actually something rather appealing about that, about the fuzzy elusiveness, the shade of Jane Austen, and the fact, after all, we don't even know whether classics is singular or plural. Classics is, classics are. I also feel some resistance to the eloquent pressures to expand the territorial range of classics, south and east, in part so that more and different people can literally see and find themselves in the subject. Basic question is, as Roger Bagnall asked recently, can making the field look distinct, less distinctively European make it seem less reserved for those of a European background? Now, it seems to me there are good and bad academic reasons for expanding the horizons of classics beyond the European Mediterranean. If disciplinary boundaries are artificial, it's a good idea to keep pushing at them and to reform them. And if at last ancient historians have realized that in order to understand the Persian Wars, they actually need to understand something about the Persians, that is long overdue, right? And you can read more of this in a great essay by Joe Quinn uh, in a recent number of the TLS. I think it looks a bit different if you work in the reception of classics, where Gilgamesh is not a rival of the Aeneid for obvious reasons that are nothing to do with quality. Part of Virgil's importance is that world writers from Dante to Leopold Sedar Senghor have read and engaged with him. I think we should be careful too, though, leaving those academic arguments aside, not to fall into the trap set by the half-baked, ill-informed tirades of the stupid alt-right, who claim to see their white selves reflected in the Greco-Roman world. It's a nasty trap, that, and it's one, I dare to say, that is not evaded simply by showing other people in the mirror. I think we should be asking whether a more robust and effective response to both diversity and the alt-right may well be to insist much more firmly that nobody owns classics, however it's defined, and none of us can possibly see ourselves in it. We are not in the ancient world. To put that more positively, one of the greatest and most mind-changing intellectual rewards for studying the classical world is that it is simultaneously familiar, because like it or not, it is in some way embedded in modern discursive practices, but it's simultaneously so strange, the ancient world is so weird and so odd, that it turns us into analysts and anthropologists, both of it and of ourselves. Classics is about all of us, and it's about none of us, and that's its diversity. I want to finish now with just two examples. That point hit home to me on two occasions recently. First was a few months ago when there was a typical social media storm uh, about the BBC's choice of a black actor to play Achilles in their drama on the Trojan War. How can you be stealing our Achilles? Was the method, was the message of many complaints or rants. The bottom line was, of course, it was kind of hard to say without joking, that Achilles didn't exist, so we had no idea what the colour of his skin was. <laughs> By the way, small points, but true. Uh, and anyway, this is acting, right? You know, this is, you know, actors pretend to be somebody else, right? Um, my colleague in Cambridge, Tim Whitmarsh, wrote a blog essay that pushed the basic point a bit further looking at how ancients saw and described and signified colour in skin or anything else, he insisted, as others have, that ancient and modern colour did not match. They could not be mapped onto one another. Antiquity, in that sense, was inevitably puzzling to us, and it forced us to think differently about a set of categories and significances we assume to be natural. It's not about finding yourself in it. And even more emotionally powerful was the final audience contribution to the SCS panel last year on rhetoric then and now that I mentioned. It was from Kathy Coleman, who recalled teaching years ago 
in apartheid South Africa uh, and teaching a mixed class discussing slavery. They were able to discuss slavery productively, she said, quotes, because it was so far away, the ancient world in time and space from every person in that classroom that we were on a level playing field. And I will take with me to my grave that as the justification of why we do what we do. Now, after 40 years of teaching in a far less politically charged context, but still broaching uncomfortable and divisive topics from religious persecution to sexual violence, those words ring a very strong final chord with me. So in closing, let me just ask you for a few seconds to reconnect with that first annual meeting of the APA in 1869. And as we leave, to cast your minds forward to what this meeting might look like in another 150 years. What will our successors be saying about classics now? Now, of course, the subject might be dead. But, you know, by then, so there might be no annual meeting in 150 years' time, but I very much doubt that. Um, my hunch is that when they look back at us, they will actually be pretty upbeat about what we're doing. They'll be celebrating our achievements. They'll be thinking about anything from bioarchaeology to the Barrington Atlas to the re-understandings of the Greek novel and our attempt to make the subject more inclusive and wider. So I hope tonight, whether it's over a drink or not, I hope tonight that we will spare a moment to pretend to be them and to celebrate us and to celebrate our achievements. Because I think we haven't done well enough, but we haven't done that bad either. Thank you. Thank you.